Massimo, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for making the time to be with us today. I have to say that you have an amazing profile. <laughs> you hold both PhDs in biology, genetics and evolutionary biology, and in philosophy. Yes. This is pretty amazing. But um, you are mostly known as a philosopher and because of the work and the research that you have done on uh, stoicism. And uh, that's what we will discuss, talk about in this conversation. And uh, the first thing is in order to frame the conversation when people, um, in general terms, think about stoicism, they think of it as a cold way of approaching life, as an unfeeling way of approaching people. Is that correct? No, it isn't. It's a stereotype, but like all stereotypes, there is a grain of truth in there, right? So it comes from somewhere. And it comes from this. The Stoics divide the emotions, what we call emotions, into two broad categories negative or disruptive emotions and positive uh, or constructive emotions. The disruptive emotions are things like uh, anger, fear, uh, hatred, things like that. And the constructive emotions are things like joy and love, uh, a sense of justice and so on and so forth. Uh, Stoicism tries to eliminate as much as possible the destructive emotions and cultivate the positive emotions. So rather than suppressing emotions in general, what the Stoics are trying to do is to shift the uh, emotional spectrum of, uh, of the normal human experience away from the negative and toward the positive. So th the truth of the stereotype is that yes, there is some attempt to eliminate emotions, but it's only the specific kinds of emotions that the Stoics thought are actually getting in the way of a good life. Uh, you don't want to be angry all the time. You don't want to be fearful all the time. You don't want to be hating people all the time. Those are things that get in the way of living a good life. But at the same time, experiencing love, joy, and you know, having a keen sense of justice and how things sh should work, that actually enhances your life. So the notion is to move away from the first and move toward the second. So if we had to briefly describe what is Stoicism, what would you say? Well, it's a philosophy of life, um, and in that respect, it's no different from other philosophies of life or even religions, uh, like Buddhism or Christianity even. Uh, every religion is also a philosophy of life, because a philosophy of life has two components, a metaphysics and an ethics. The metaphysics basically means that there is some way in which you understand the world works. Right, so if you're a Christian, the world was created by God uh, in a certain way and for certain reasons, and it works uh, because God decrees that it has to work in a certain way. If you are a Buddhist, uh, you, you will take a different approach to the metaphysics, to why the world works. If you're a Stoic, a third one, and so on and so forth. The second component is an ethics. An ethics is what tells you how to behave in that world. And usually the two are connected. The notion is if you are a Christian, for instance, you know, I grew up Catholic, and if you're a Christian, well, uh, not only you understand that the world is made and created in a certain way, but you also understand that you have to behave in the way in which God says you should behave. So Stoicism is simply one more uh, version of this general approach. It's, it's a way to orient yourself in life. Now, specifically, what differentiates Stoicism from other philosophies of life uh, or religions is that it starts out with one important premise and, and, there are, and it is based uh, as a practice on two different approaches. So, so very briefly, the premise of all of Stoic philosophy is that we should live according to nature, as the ancient Stoics used to say. Now, when I say that phrase, people start thinking that they need to go naked into the woods and hug trees and stuff like that. It's not that, although there's nothing wrong with doing it, if you'd like, but that's not Stoicism. Living according to nature means that the Stoics uh, ask themselves, what kind of being are human beings? What kind of living organism are we? What is it that differentiates us from other living organisms? Every living organism tries to live according to nature. If you're a plant, you try to get sun and because that's the, the nature of plants. If you are a lion, uh, you would behave in certain ways because that's the nature of a lion. According to the Stoics, the nature of human beings fundamentally is that we are highly social organisms and we're capable of reason. Uh, 
or highly social, meaning that we can survive on our own if we have to, but we only thrive in a society when we are in contact with others, when we're in interaction with others. And capable of reason doesn't mean that we reason well all the time. In fact, most of the times we don't, arguably. Um, but we're capable of it, and we're capable of, of reasoning to a far higher degree than any other species on Earth. So from these two premises, from the fact that we are social and capable of reason, the Stoics concluded that then a good human life, a human life worth living, is one in which you apply reason to the betterment of society, to improve social living. So that's the fundamental notion of Stoicism. Everything else sort of follows, follows up from it. Uh, there are specific techniques that the Stoics put into practice, specific approaches, and we can talk about it uh, later, that they put in practice. But fundamentally, what differentiates Stoicism from other philosophies of life is that uh, for a Stoic, a good human life is one in which you use reason to help others and yourself. Uh, the Stoics don't make a fundamental distinction between yourself and the rest of society. You are embedded in society, so if you improve yourself, you're automatically improving society. If you work to make society better, you're automatically better, making things better for you. Massimo, you have described yourself as an Stoic. When and why did you decide to embrace this philosophy? Not that long ago, it was about five years ago. And uh, the story is that, so I, would go, I was going through a little bit of a midlife crisis at the time. You know, the usual thing that happens when you're in your 40s, you know, <laughs> divorce and change of job, my father died, you know, this kind of stuff that happens in life. And it is not that I was particularly overwhelmed by it, but it was a pretty tough period, right? And so that was also the time when I started studying philosophy uh, seriously. So I was a practicing scientist, an evolutionary biologist, and I was going back to graduate school and get my PhD in philosophy. So now you cannot start studying philosophy even at a graduate level, you know, sort of very technical philosophy, without really running into more broad issues such as the meaning of life and, you know, ethics and how you're going to live your life. So that, the fact that I was going through a personal crisis and at the same time studying philosophy sort of made me think that maybe that there were some general ways of answering questions, some, some general way of thinking that was going to be useful. Um, when I started looking into it, it seemed clear to me that, that the best candidate, for me at least, was something that in philosophy is called virtue ethics. Virtue ethics is an approach to living your life that basically tells you that you should be focusing on improving your character, essentially. That's, that's the basic idea. Now, when you start studying virtue ethics, you have a number of options, however, because in ancient Greece and Rome, there were a number of virtue ethical schools. The most famous ones is the Aristotelian one. So you start with Aristotle. And I, I read Aristotle and I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. The guy is saying some very interesting things. But there wasn't that much in the way of practical application. I didn't really have a clear idea of how do you translate Aristotle's ideas into a day-to-day -day life? How is that going to help me with dealing with the grief for, for, from losing my father, for instance? It's like, nah. The second stop usually is Epicurus. Epicureanism is another kind of virtual ethical philosophy. And Epicureanism is very interesting because it, has, it puts an emphasis on friendship and relationships. The problem with Epicureanism is that the goal of an Epicurean is to minimize pain in life. I know we, all, we normally think of Epicureans as people you know, into, um, into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But that wasn't really the case. Um, it's true that Epicureans thought that pleasure is, is important for human beings. But fundamentally, what they were trying to do is to avoid pain, both mental and physical pain. And so Epicurus said that in order to do that, you should not engage politically or socially with the world. Because as we all know, social and political involvement does cause pain. And I thought, well, that's interesting, but that's not for me. I, I can't live, life to me is not meaningful unless you do have a social and political involvement. So I was in that ballpark. I figured that virtue ethics was somewhere where a good answer for me might come, uh, but it wasn't Aristotle and it wasn't Epicurus. And then one day um, on Twitter, of all places, I see a thing that says, um, help us celebrate Stoic Week. And I thought, what the hell is Stoic Week? And, and why is anybody celebrating the Stoics? I had a vague recollection of, that the Stoics were also virtu into virtue ethics. They were another, yet another school of virtue ethics. And I read Marcus Aurelius when I was in school. 
I even translated Seneca from Latin when I was in school, but I never made the connection that these were people actually that were talking about a philosophy of life. So I was curious. So I signed up uh, for Stoic Week, which happens every, every year, usually in October. And um, so for a week, I lived like a Stoic, meaning that you start reading about the Stoics, uh, you download a sort of a handbook that has exercises, da daily exercises, there's kind of meditation exercises or journaling exercises, things like that. And so I did it for a week and I and immediately clicked. I, I thought, wow, this, this is really powerful approach. This is really helpful. This is actually giving me an interesting uh, direction where to go. So at the end of the week, I decided to commit to it for another couple of months as an experiment on myself. And then after that, I committed to another year. And now here we are and still talking about it, uh, you know, a couple of books later. So, Massimo, that's amazing. And actually what you were explaining, it's a little bit in line with what I was going to ask you, because you mentioned, and it's true, Stoicism is a very old philosophy. It's more than 2,000 years old. But we are seeing a revival of this philosophy nowadays. What do you think are the main drivers of this revolt of Stoicism? That's a good question, and one can only guess, but, uh, but there are two or three considerations uh, about the arrival of Stoicism. First of all, yes, it is more than 2,000 years old. It started out in 300 BCE um, with Zeno Sadium in, in Athens. But then again, so is Buddhism. Buddhism is two and a half millennia old, and Christianity is 2,000 years old. So all of these philosophies or religions are still with us, and they're still meaningful to us, even though uh, superficially, our life is very different, right, from ancient Rome or ancient Palestine or, or ancient India. But I say superficially because, yes, it's true that we go around with smartphones and, you know, and, and we have computers and stuff like that. Um, but it's also true that essentially humanity hasn't changed. We still have the same wants and needs. We still want to be loved by other people. We still are resentful under certain circumstances. We, we get angry under other circumstances. So, so life as a human being hasn't been really that different, which is why all of these philosophies of life and religions are still meaningful to people. But Stoicism in particular, um, the last sort of formal uh, uh, Stoic school that we know of is that of Epictetus, who lived in the second century uh, of the current era. So by the third century, Stoicism kind of died, died down as, as a formal philosophy. But it influenced Christianity. Paul of Tarsus, or St. Paul, was uh, actually very aware of the Stoics and wrote about the Stoics with, you know, he was criti criticizing them because he was on a, on a different, of a different persuasion, so to speak. But he also had a lot of respect for the Stoics. And in fact, a lot of Stoic ideas got incorporated into Christianity. Thomas Aquinas, uh, later in the Middle Ages, arguably the most important Christian theologian of all time, uh, came up with a list of seven virtues that Christians should practice. And the first four of these are the same, the very same ones that the Stoics used. And these are practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance, to which uh, Aquinas added the three more clearly Christian virtues of hope, faith, and, and uh, charity. Um, so Stoicism had an influence on a number of thinkers, particularly Christian thinkers, but also Jewish thinkers throughout the Middle Ages. Um, modern philosophers like Descartes and Spinoza were influenced by the, the Stoics. So Stoicism never really died down. But you're definitely right that it sort of reemerged all of a sudden, like the last couple of decades or even less. And so it's, it's a good question to ask why. I mean, there are a number of reasons. First of all, because uh, we live in turbulent times and turbulent times usually bring people to embrace uh, philosophies that are focused on self-improvement and, and, and on things that are under, under your control. I don't think it's by chance that, for instance, a lot of the Greek and Roman philosophies all of us emerged all of a sudden uh, in the span of about like 100 years. And that happened between the death of Alexander the Great uh, and the beginning of the Roman Empire. Why? Because those were moments in history where the Mediterranean world was in complete upheaval. Things were changing dramatically, empires were collapsing, people's lives were up, uh, turned up, died, upside down, and people had no idea how to deal with this. So that's probably one reason then these philosophies came about. The same can be said for Buddhism in ancient India, uh, same kind of cultural, historical uh, background. The same can be said for Confucianism in, in China. Now today, we live yet again in a situation where, you know, there's 
global climate change. There is possibility of, of, of nuclear Armageddon. There is uh, radical political changes happening without really much that we can do to actually control these things. So one of the reasons I think why Stoicism is becoming popular again is because it is the kind of philosophy that helps you focus on what's under your control. And uh, that's helpful to reduce stress and to feel like you're actually living a life that, it's, that it's, makes some sense. That's one reason. Another reason is that a number of modern uh, psychotherapies uh, evolved during the early part of the 20th century and, and especially, especially in the 1950s and 60s um, that were inspired by the Stoics. The most Obvious one is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a major type of psychotherapy these days. It's evidence-based, as they say. In other words, there is empirical evidence that it actually works. Well, psychotherapy started out in the late 19, uh, sorry, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy started out in the late 1950s or early 60s, and two of the founders uh, of CBT, as it's called, actually were directly inspired by the Stoics. They read Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and Seneca, and they thought, wow, these guys actually have come up with really interesting ideas that can be systematized, uh, that can be applied empirically to actually make people's lives better. And since CBT has become the most popular kind of psychotherapy, uh, I think that has helped uh, sort of a revival of stoicism because there is essentially a scientific empirical basis to some of the things that the stoics were, were saying and suggesting. And then the third reason, I think, is because a number of individuals uh, especially in the last two or three decades, have actually made a concerted effort to bring Stoicism back. The first one was Pierre Hadot, who was a, a classicist uh, in France, who wrote two or three books that, are, that were very popular in the early 90s, one of which is The Inner Citadel, which is a book on Marcus Aurelius' meditations. And Hadot was, was adamant that he was doing this not because he was interested in sort of ancient philosophy for its own sake, but because he was interested in philosophy as a way of life, to bring back this notion that the ancient Greeks and Romans had, that philosophy isn't an uh, academic exercise, or at least it's not only an academic exercise. It's actually something you need to live uh, day, day to day. Pierre, though, in turn influenced a number of other people, and a few years ago, uh, a group of psychotherapists uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapists, philosophers, uh, classic scholars, and assorted others started this thing that I referred to earlier, Stoic Week, um, and as well as an annual conference, StoicCon, uh, which is now in its fifth or sixth, I think, uh, year. And it became very popular. Immediately, the, the, sort of the press started covering it. Uh, Stoicism has appeared everywhere in New York Times, Washington Post. Uh, international newspapers and magazines uh, because people are responding. Just to give you an example, uh, there is a major Facebook page devoted to stories. There are several, but one of them is fairly large. And just a couple of years ago, it was already impressive, but it was about 30,000 people. I checked this morning before coming here, and it's already 55,000 people. That's a large number of people interested in uh, what you would think it's an arcane philosophy. I mean, I can understand, Massimo, that because of these, as you said, uncertain times that we live in, people try to, let's say, find references or ways of living that make things easier or try to minimize uh, how, how much we uh, get anxious about things that we cannot control. But um, what I see is a trend to take that into an extreme, and let me frame it, especially in, uh, in places like Silicon Valley, we are seeing yeah. all these CEOs, multimillion people with tons of money yeah. that actually they are proud of showing up to everybody how much they suffer by um, taking cold showers early in the morning, by starving mm. for long periods of time, by isolating themselves from uh, any human contact for mm. several days. So. Why this virtue of showing suffering to other yeah. people? No, you're right. That is an extreme. And in fact, not only it's an extreme, but it's really not stoicism, uh, even though these people claim that they're doing stoicism. I refer to it as stoicism with a dollar sign. 
uh, which is clearly not the, the original thing. So first of all, yes, this, this is happening. Uh, but again, it's not typical just of Stoicism, right? There is, there is the um, Buddhism has its a similar problem with uh, mindfulness, with, with this notion that mindfulness is now becoming a you know, highly marketable thing that can solve every problem you can imagine. So, so that... It's got, Buddhism's got that problem. Christianity's got a similar problem. There's such a thing as the, uh, called as the, the, the prosperity gospels, where people use the gospels in order to become wealthy and make money. Look, any good idea can be turned into a really bad one uh, if you either misunderstand it or you use it for purposes that it was not designed for, right? In the specific case of Silicon Valley stoicism uh, sort of approach, here's what the problem is. So Stoicism is both a philosophy of life and a set of techniques. Okay. As a philosophy of life, it tells you that you should be living, as I said earlier, according to nature, meaning using your, your mind in order, your, your reasoning abilities in order to improve social living, um, which means life for others mostly. But it's also a, a set of technique, techniques. There are, there are things like, yeah, uh, subjecting yourself to mild self-deprivation exercises in order to, which are, which are meant, for instance, fasting or the cold showers and that sort of stuff. But those are meant as exercises in thankfulness. Those are meant to remind you that you should be thankful of the fact that you have hot water uh, whenever you want, or that you should be thankful that you have a meal every time that you have it, that you want it, and so on and so forth. So those are techniques, you know, journaling, you know, write, writing down your thoughts into a journal every day with specific questions in mind about how did you behave today in terms of uh, the four cardinal, cardinal virtues of stoicism. Those are techniques. Now, the techniques can be decoupled from the philosophy. Uh, and they can be decoupled in a good way or in a not so good way. So I mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy does use a number of techniques that were developed by the Stoics. But it's not a philosophy of life. You don't go to therapy because you say, well, I want to hear, I want to know how to live my life. You go to therapy because you have a specific problem. You have a particular phobia or you suffer from depression or whatever it is, right? Those techniques are useful. They're efficacious for, for those specific problems. But you're not practicing a philosophy. You're just doing therapy. So the, the problem with the Silicon Valley uh, sort of stoicism is that they focus on the techniques. And then they claim that that's the Stoic philosophy. But it isn't, because the Stoics were very clear about the fact that a lot of wealth is actually not a good thing. Um, because, first of all, it distracts you from other things. If, you're first, if your major goal in life is to become wealthy, you're already missing the boat as far as the Stoics are concerned. Your major goal in life should be to be helpful to the human cosmopolis, as they call it, to the human sort of general uh, society. So those, those two are odd already. Um, and so if, if, if your goal is to become wealthy or rich or, uh, or famous or you know, powerful or whatever it is, you're really missing the point. That's not, that's not what Stoicism is, is about. Um, I try to educate these people <laughs> <laughs> to my best. Um, and sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't. Um, that's one of the things that is not under your control. And so you just accept it for what it is. Massimo, I want to talk about the techniques a little bit more, because you have written more several books on the topic, and in one of them, How to Be an Stoic, I think that you uh, mentioned 12 recommendations yes. uh, for people on how to use this approach to life in order to better live, to have yes. a better life yes. in our 21st century. So could you walk us through those 12 recommendations? Yeah, let me, let me pick some of the, the more easy to, to practice. By the way, there is a new book actually that a, where a friend of mine, Greg Lopez, um, would just put out in, in English. It's called A Handbook for New Stoics, and it will be translated in Spanish soon. Um, and that book actually has 52 exercises. So there is actually quite a bit of, of, of choices. And of course, the point is that one should, should uh, practice all of them. One, one should just try it out. Uh, some exercises are useful for some people, others are useful for other people. Again, this is just the same as cognitive behavioral therapy. When you go to a therapist, the therapist is gonna try certain things with you. If they work, great, you keep doing it. If they don't work, then you'll try something else. But let me give you some examples of sort of my favorite, the ones that I actually do on a regular basis. We already talked a little bit about the self-deprivation exercises. Although often you hear 
uh, talk only in terms of, of about those only in terms of you know the cold showers and the, the, the fasting. That's fine, but there are other more interesting ways to do self deprivation. In fact, self deprivation is particularly useful if you do it about things for which you have a problem, and then you try to work on. So, for instance, if you find yourself spending too much money by shopping too often, then here's a technique for you. I call it the walk through the mall. And what I do on an occasional basis is I, I pick an area of New York where there's a lot of, of shops. And I very deliberately go from one to the other, looking at everything that they have on merchandise and don't buy anything. And then at the end of the exercise, you tell yourself uh, something that apparently Socrates told himself when he was doing the similar thing, which is, I didn't know there was so much stuff I did not need. So the point of the exercise is that we live in a consumerist society. We're pressured constantly by other people, by advertisers, to buy things. And we, we think that buying things will make us happy. Now, some things are useful. It's, you know, I carry a, a, a smartphone uh, with me because it's useful. These days, you can't live in a technological society. It's, it's, you know, it's very hard to live in a technological society without a smartphone. But do I need the latest version of it? No, I don't. Uh, do, I, do I need to replace it every time that a new thing comes up? I don't, because mine is perfectly fine. It's, it's a little old, but it's perfectly fine. So it's a reminder of the fact that you don't have to uh, cave into these kinds of pressures, that you are in charge of making those kinds of decisions. You should have a reason for why you buy certain things or you do certain things. So that's one of the exercises. Um, one that, I find that, that I'm sure it's not going to come, out, come across as very fun, but actually it's very useful, is the, um, it goes under a number of names, but um, memento mori is probably the best one. Uh, that's from Latin, from remember you have to die. If there is one thing nobody wants to talk about, especially in 20th, 21st century America and probably many other Western countries, is death. You know, we try to stay away with as, as, as much as possible. In other societies, that's not the case. Children are exposed to people who die or even who decay, uh, decaying bodies in order to get them used to the notion that death is a natural and inevitable thing. But we try to stay away from it. We, we, we are obsessed with remaining young and healthy, which is great, except that it's, you know, it's a losing battle eventually because, you know, you will get old and, and decrepit and eventually you'll die. So the question isn't whether you're gonna die, the question is how you're gonna get there. The question is, you know, are you ready for, for that kind of moment? So one way the Stoics prepare themselves to it um, is by reminding themselves of mortality. And there are different ways of doing this. One of my favorite one is I go to a really nice cemetery downtown in, uh, you know, in lower Manhattan, which is surrounded by uh, uh, skyscrapers and traffic, so there's just noise and people everywhere, but the cemetery is in the middle of everything and it's a very quiet kind of place, as cemeteries tend to, to be. So what I do is I just take a nice leisurely walk, I read the names and the dates on the tombstones, and I remind myself that everyone, including me of course, is eventually going to be in that state. Now, why would you want to do that, right? It's like, that's, isn't that depressing or something like that? I don't find it depressing because what I find actually, it's, uh, it's energizing. When I come out of that, I said, okay, I got a limited period of time here. So what do I want to do in the meantime? How do I want to spend my life? What kind of uh, things are important to me? How should I not waste my, the time that I have? I don't know how much time I have. I could die you know, in a few decades, in a few years, tomorrow, who knows? And the question then becomes, well, what would, what would you want to do in the meantime? How do you want to spend your life? How do you want to get to your deathbed looking back and say, you know, that was actually a pretty well spent life. So I think that that's a very useful exercise. Arguably the, the most useful exercise that I do on a regular basis is the journaling. Now journaling has a long history. Marcus Aurelius Meditations was his journal to himself. That's how he would use it. And, and the technique predates uh, Marcus. But it's very useful if, it, if it's done in a certain way. So journaling is not the same thing as keeping a diary about your life. You, you don't write down, oh, today I went to the beach or you know, something like that. That's, that's not relevant as far as the Stoics are concerned. Great for you that you went to the beach, but it's not. It doesn't have any ethical balance. It doesn't really uh, tell you anything interesting uh, or important about, I should say, about uh, how to live your life. There are different ways of doing journalism, but both Seneca and Epictetus are very clear, actually, on how you should do it. They actually give you instructions. And um, uh, my favorite way of doing it is follows actually Seneca, 
where he says that before going to bed, when things are quiet in the, in the house, you find a, a quiet corner from, for a minute, and you ask yourself three questions. And um, I do it in writing, so I actually write, write this thing down. The first question is, what did I do wrong today? The second one is, what did I do right? The third one is, what could I do differently? So the first question, what did I do wrong, is not to, you know, flag yourself on, flog yourself on the back and say, oh, you, I've done bad things. It's to learn from your experiences, right? For the Stoics, the past is outside of your control, so there's no sense in regretting things. You made a mistake, you made a mistake, that's it. Um, th th if you feel bad about it, you're not actually changing anything. You can't undo the mistake. But what you can do is to learn from it. So you can reflect on it and say, oh, so this is what I did today, and this is where I went wrong. Uh, why is this useful? Because our lives are actually far less varied than we might think. We tend to get into the same situations over and over. So we tend to make the same mistakes over and over. So if you start paying attention to where you go wrong, then presumably it's possible or it's more likely that the next time you're actually not going to repeat the mistake. The second question is, um, what did I do right? Well, there's two reasons to ask that, yourself that question. First one is pat yourself on the back. Great. Good job. Um, we all need some kind of positive self, you know, reinforcement. But the second one is because now you have two uh, yeah, contrasting positions where you don't want to be, your mistakes, and where you do want to be, the things you're doing wrong, right. So the notion is that day by day, you're hopefully going to make, by paying attention, you're actually going to make progress. You're going to move away from this and toward this one. Right. So those are the first two questions. The third question is, you know, what could I have done differently? Again, this is not about regret. So, oh, I should have done things this way. It's about planning for the future. It's like, oh, so I made a mistake. Well, under similar circumstances in the future, how can I possibly act better? For instance, um, you know, I'm a teacher. So, you know, maybe one of my colleagues or one of my students has uh, gone on my nerves today and I kind of reacted with harsh words. Um, well, that was not a good thing to do. What can I do uh, better in the future? Well, I know I should expect that sometimes that kind of stuff happens. Um, and if I expect it, I can actually you know, react in a more positive way. I can say, well, this guy's been, you know, he's under stress or he's not understanding what I'm saying. So let me try to explain it better instead of getting upset. Getting upset doesn't, and responding you know, with anger doesn't actually help anybody. Nobody, nobody's ever responded well to, uh, to anger. So if you know ahead of time, if you reflect on strategies that you might employ to react better to a particular situation, that's helpful. So that's a major technique that, um, uh, in, uh, in stoicism. Another one of my favorite um, has to do with what the Stoics call the, the view from above. The view from above is a way basically to put things in perspective. We tend to be caught up in the moment and think that whatever it is that we're happening, that it's happening to us, and it's not good, it's a catastrophe. It's, it's, it's like, oh, this is horrible. This is such a thing. How can I possibly be, ha be happening to me, right? And I'm talking even minor things. I mean, you know, like, oh, the subway is delayed by 10 minutes. Oh, that's impossible. <laughs> I, you know, how, how can I possibly live with the subway? Well, you can, as it turns out. It's not that difficult. And it happens all the time. So why are you surprised <laughs> that the subway is late by 10 minutes? In fact, you should be happy that it's only 10 minutes, right? Um, the view from above is a way to remind yourself of, of putting things in, in perspective. First of all, this is also a technique that is actually used in cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, the therapists call it catastrophizing. Uh, so when, when we, they turn into a verb, when we make everything into a catastrophe, we're actually imposing a value judgment on things that are really not that bad. And so we convince ourselves that they are really bad. And by convincing ourselves that they're better, we get even more upset. And this goes into a spiral uh, that makes us angry and so on. It's, instead, you can just think of it in a different way. You can say, well, so let's take the broad perspective here for a minute. Uh, I'm complaining about the fact that the subways are 10 minutes late. Then again, I also am one of the few uh, lucky living, li you know, uh, living human beings that actually has a subway in the entire history of humanity. For most of the time, people had to walk somewhere or take a horse if they were lucky enough to have a horse. I, on the other hand, can zip up and down Manhattan and Brooklyn in you know, less than an hour through this amazing thing that goes underground and that works after all most of the time. So 
putting things in perspective helps you dealing with whatever situation it is. Like you remind yourself that actually things in the broad, broad schemes of things are not that bad. Or um, let's say uh, something bad happens to you, you know, a friend of yours is, is, is uh, you know, you're having a difficult relationship and this is an important friendship, so you suffer as a result. Well, you can remind yourself of the fact that this happens to other people. This is not, it's not just you. This, this is, it's not that the universe somehow has turned against you. This is a normal, normal occurrence. People break up, friends leave you, uh, things change. Change, in fact, Marcus Aurelius kept telling himself, is, a, is the only constant in life. The, everything changes if you wait long enough. Now, that doesn't mean that your friend leaving you or, or having a problem with, with a relationship is not important, is not, is not a problem. It is a problem. But once you put it into perspective, you can say, well, let's see if I can address the problem in a sort of a constructive, positive way. And if I can't, it's definitely not the end of the world. Relationships do end, both with you know, partners and friends and so on and so forth. That sometimes happens, and it's not a catastrophe, you'll survive. You're, you're okay, you're gonna be okay. Uh, there are gonna be other people. Uh, you're, you have other friends, you're gonna be uh, having other relations. So putting things in perspective from this sort of view from above, it's called a view from above because typically the, the notion is that you should look at yourself as if from a camera, from a distant um, perspective, so that you put things into uh, a more normal, more reasonable, more wide uh, way of looking at things. Massimo, one of the things about stoicism that surprised me the most was, um, I think you said this, correct me if I'm wrong, that nobody does wrong things on purpose. Right. That evil comes out of ignorance. Right. And uh, I would like you to elaborate on that idea. <laughs> yeah, it's an idea that every time that I put it forth, somebody gets really upset. <laughs> um, and the first thing they say, oh, what do you mean that, that Hitler was not evil? You know, because typically the, the, the obvious example of, of, of evil is Hitler. Okay, so here's what exactly what the Stoics meant. That, that phrase actually comes from Socrates. Uh, nobody, uh, you know, the only, the only evil is ignorance. However, if you actually look at the Greek word that was used by Plato when he was uh, sort of reporting Socrates' words, the word is amatia, and amatia is not, doesn't usually, doesn't actually translate as ignorance. It translates literally as unwisdom, lack of wisdom. So people do bad things because of lack of wisdom not ignorance in the sense that they don't know what they're doing, not ignorance in the sense that they didn't go to college or anything like that. It's lack of knowledge of what is the right thing to do, right? Wisdom, after all, is one definition of wisdom, at least, is that it is knowledge of what is the right thing to do and what is not the right thing to do. Now, even with that explanation, a lot of people are not, not happy and they say, oh, what are you talking about? Tell, telling me that Hitler was unwise. No, he was just evil. Well, think about it this way. Most people, I would say almost everybody, that does bad things, they don't actually think that they're doing bad things. You know, the, the cartoonish version of the evil person who goes in the, up in the, in, you know, gets up in the morning, goes in the mirror and says, Mwaha, what kind of evil <laughs> thing can I do today? That's Disney, that's, that's cartoonish. Nobody does that, probably not even Hitler. Um, we know a lot about Hitler, in fact, because he wrote what he, was, what he was thinking and because we have a lot of documents and letters and testimony from other people. He thought he was right. He thought that the German nation had been mistreated after World War I, and that's true, incidentally. Everybody, every historian of that rec recognized that. He thought that somehow the major culprit was the Jewish uh, you know, population. That, he was wrong on that one, but he thought he had reasons to do certain things. He thought he was doing good by the German people by trying to solve problems in a certain way. Why? Now, was he horribly mistaken? Yes. There's no question he was horribly mistaken, right? Should he have been taken out of commission? Absolutely, that he should have been taken out of commission as soon as possible. Uh, should we have thought World War II uh, against the Nazi? Absolutely, there's no question. But if we, even, even when we're, com we're, we're considering that level of bad stuff, if we just say, oh, that's evil, in a sense, that's refusing to understand. If you don't understand why people do that kind of bad thing, you're likely not to get it the next time also and to make the same mistake over and over. 
When uh, New York was attacked on 9-11, President Bush famously said, they hate us because of our freedom. No, they don't. There are very different reasons why 9-11 happened. It has to do with uh, American policy in the Middle East over a period of decades. It has to do with the presence of American troops in Saudi Arabia, which is considered sacred soil by uh, Muslims and so on and so forth. There are reasons why they do that. Now, reasons don't justify, right? Uh, one can have bad reasons to do certain things or one can have good reasons and then still do a bad thing. You can have the good reason that Germany was ill-treated at the end of World War I, or you can have the good reason that you don't want American troops on your soil. That doesn't mean that the correct answer to those problems is genocide uh, or, or the 9-11 attacks, right? But if we keep just using that word, evil, to label people, this is a way to dehumanize other people and, and therefore of refusing to understand them. And if you don't understand other people, you're really likely to, to run again and again into the same problems because you just don't get it. Why are these people doing that? Oh, because they're evil. That's not an answer. That's just a label that we put on things. Uh, the same goes for any kind of label that we um, tend to put on other things. So somebody says something um, that is, you know, say, highly questionable uh, in terms of ethnicities or, or gender, and you immediately say, label him. Oh, that's, that's racist. Well, it may be, but that doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't tell me how to, how to deal with that person, how, why that person is thinking the way he's thinking. How do I go about correcting that person? So the Stoics had a different approach. Uh, Marcus Aurelius basically said, look, you only have two choices with people who do bad things. You either teach them or put up with them. The first option is to teach them. You have to try to explain things to, to people. You have to try to make them see that what they're doing is not the right way to, to go about it. If you can't, because sometimes people don't listen, but sometimes people don't learn, then you put up with them, or if the behavior is violent and destructive, then you put them away. I mean, the Stoics had absolutely no problem in using violence if it was necessary, but it was always the last resort. It's always a question of, and you don't, the, the Stoics are not the only ones who use this approach, right? The Christians often say, hate the sin, but not the sinner. It's the same idea, right? So you don't, you don't go after the individual. You, you block the individual from doing bad stuff if you, if, you, if you need to. But then you don't, on top of that, say, oh, he's, he's an evil, he's bad. It's, just say, well, he's, he's mistaken. He's, he doesn't know better. So I'm going to block him from doing what he, needs, what, what he was doing to, to do, but then I'm gonna to try to see if I can recover him as a human being, instead of just putting him away and throw away the, the, the key. Massimo, there are a couple of things that I think have become trademarks of the society we live in, this 21st century society, these technology-driven societies. And um, I would like to know what Stoicism says about them and how to better deal with them, because definitely they are not going to go away. So the first one is about actually a phenomenon that it was considered a necessary evil for many, many years, mm -hmm. and now it has become cool, a kind of cool thing, especially cool. in America, in American culture, also in Western European culture, and is stress. Yeah. The concept of being stressed, the concept of being busy all the time, Previously, it was something that was seen wrong, mm -hmm. let's say. Now, if you are inaccessible because you are way too busy, actually that has become cool. Yeah. This hyperactivity has become cool. Yeah. So I want to know what Stoicism says about that. Yeah, so Seneca actually talks about it directly. Uh, he talks about being too busy is not a good thing. Um, and the reason for that, he says, because that distracts you from the real important things in life. Not everything is important. And just because you're, you're doing something, that doesn't mean you're doing something good or something useful or something interesting or something meaningful. And so the Stoics tend to focus, pay attention to what they're doing and especially why they're doing it. Um, so being busy for the sake of being busy or for appearing being busy, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a child game. Um, everybody can be busy doing all sorts of nonsensical stuff uh, or, thing, or things that are actually not useful. But ask yourself this question. Um, should this be your, the last day of your life? Would you really be want to do that? So this is one of the exercises that we, that we propose with my friend Greg in, in, in the new book. We say, spend an entire week by paying attention to how you, you, what you do during the day. And then at the end of every day, make a list of at least three activities that you 
spent hours doing. And then ask yourself, are these activities making you better, making your life better? And second, would you want to do those things if you knew that this was the last day of your life? It's an interesting exercise. It's not to be taken literally. It's not, it's like, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to think about the last day of your life really seriously. But yeah, it's a thought experiment. It's like, so if I, today I was busy spending a lot of time on, on social media, for instance, right? Would that be a good way to spend my time on the last day of, <laughs> on earth? Probably not. Most people would say, no, nah, that's probably not. Well, if the answer is probably not, then you might want to cut down on that one. Then that's a signal that that's not the kind of activity you want to spend a lot of time with. So business, you know, being busy for its own sake, uh, being stressed for, its, for, its, for, for the sake of sort of somehow, uh, uh, you know, my, uh, sending the signal to other people that you're valuable, that your time is valuable, and so on and so forth. Why do you care? First of all, um, the Stoics would say that the only thing that's truly under your control is your own opinions, judgments, and decisions to act, not other people's. So other people's opinions may be interesting if you learn something from them, but ultimately, they're their opinions. You don't control them. And if you spend your life trying to be uh, you know, well regarded by other people, trying to become famous and so on and so forth, you're wasting a lot of time because fame is fickle. You're gonna be famous and well regarded today and then somebody else, you know, lots of people are gonna turn against you tomorrow depending on how things change, how the culture changes, how uh, other people uh, view, view life. So it's a, it's a waste of time. You should be focusing on what is actually important for you and you should be asking yourself, why is this thing important for me? What am I doing? Well, why am I doing it? I have to ask you something, Massimo, because actually, I mean, it's, you almost introduce the, this, the second trait of our society, <laughs> okay. okay? And is this, uh, now everybody wants to, to be famous. Yeah. Everyone wants to be like, yeah, be a role model for everything. And um, actually there is a tool a new tool, modern tool, that now pervades society with social media, right. that actually has become also a source of a constant stimuli, not always good. Yeah. And uh, I want also to know your opinion and what Stoicism says about that. Yeah, so that's the other thing. It depends on, so, so social media are tools, right? And it, like every tool, you can use it properly, or not. Uh, if you have a hammer and you use it in order to nail things into the wall, that's perfectly fine use of a, of a, of a hammer. If on the other hand you start you know, going around and, and, and beating people up with a hammer, that's probably not a good use of, of a hammer. So, so it, the same thing is with social media. I use social media quite a bit, but I tend to use them for two main reasons. One, to keep in touch with my family overseas because some of my, most of my family is in Italy and I live in New York, so it's difficult to keep in touch. So it's nice to you know, see pictures or videos of my nephew and niece, for instance, and things like that. Uh, but I do realize that that is family time, and so it should be limited. I do it only for a few minutes a day, or even not every, not every day, because that's the purpose. If I started doing it on a regular basis, then that would turn into a major sort of waste of time, because, you know, how many videos and pictures of my nephew and niece do I need to look at anyway? And I never, ever look at pictures of cats. <laughs> I don't think that's a good use of your time. Um, we all know what a cat looks like. Now, um, I also, the major use that I make of social media, however, is for work. Right? So I use social media in order to, f on the one hand, promote my own works, if, if there is a, whether it's a book or a paper or an article or, or a podcast or a video, whatever it is, social media are a great way to sort of have, tell other people, hey, if you're interested, there's this thing out there. Um, or to go out and, and follow people who I think they're interesting and who I think post things that I want to read or I want to watch and things and so on. So, so, but even that, again, it's a work-related related application that has its limits. I don't do it several hours a day because then if I did it several hours a day, then that's time that I actually should be spending actually reading books or papers or actually watching uh, you know, videos or, or listening to podcasts. And if I keep being on, on social media, it becomes a waste of time. So what the Stoic would say is that 
two, two things. First of all, every tool is just a tool, so it depends, it's up to you to use it properly or improperly, right? Um, the tool isn't gonna tell you how to use it. Um, Epictetus' discourses starts out with this interesting uh, sentence by Epictetus. He says, so you got some money. What are you gonna do with it? The money isn't gonna tell you. Because money is also a tool, right? We don't accumulate money just for the sake of accumulating money. There's, there's no point in that. You want money because you wanna do other things with it. You wanna buy a house, you wanna buy a car, you wanna do this or go on a vacation, whatever it is. You don't, you don't get money for its own sake. But how to properly use money is not something that comes out of the money itself. It's your own judgment, right? So the same goes with anything that we use in life, including social media. As far as fame is concerned, Marcus Aurelius goes over and over about this. Now remember, he was an emperor. So he was the most power, literally the most powerful person in the Roman world at the time. And um, he was sensitive to the fact that other people were using flattery to gain access to him or to gain benefits from him, right? And we have a pretty good evidence from in independent sources that he tr they always tried to be as fair as possible in his dealings with other people. But he was constantly under pressure of, you know, so, so these, these um, people that were flattering him. And so in the meditations, over and over, he writes down, he says, remember, Alexander the Great was a far more important king than you are, and yet he's dead. And the fact that he's famous doesn't do him any good. And in fact, lots of people become, you know, uh, caught up so much into the fame thing that they lose control of things and they lose touch of what is actually important to them. Once you, when, again, ask yourself the question, if you want to get to the end, of, you get to the end of your life and you look back, what sort of things are you going to be proud of? We actually have answers to that because psychologists have done uh, research on what is on the mind of people that are about to die. And I guarantee you, it's not the number of followers on Twitter. Right? What is on the mind of people is, did I do something meaningful with my life? What about my love relations? What about my friends? Those are the things that actually are on people's minds, not how many uh, followers on social media they have, or not even how much money they got, unless they actually use that money for something that was meaningful for, to make other people's lives better. So Massimo, I would like to put an end to the interview, zooming up everything that we have talked about, and also looking a little bit into the future. We started this conversation talking about how Stoicism is currently experiencing our revival, and um, how do you say, do you see that something that is here to stay is something that is going to be replaced by who knows what, another trend that will come? How do you see it evolving? Good question. Well, first of all, predicting the future is a fool's errand, so we, we need to be very careful about making predictions. Uh, who, who knows how it's going to go? It's certainly possible that uh, it's now that, that stoicism is now going through a wave of popularity, and then it will sort of subside, and something else will come up. That's certainly a uh, uh, possibility. However, the ideas themselves have survived for almost two and a half millennia, so they're going to stay. I, at this point, you know, if something lasts for that long, uh, it, whether it is Stoicism or Buddhism or Christianity or Confucianism, it's probably going to stay a little, a little bit longer. So I would say that the ideas are going to stay regardless of whether the popularity in the moment of the philosophy uh, will wane or not. But at the same time, I don't see any reason why Stoicism couldn't become just as popular as, let's say, Buddhism with time. In fact, I think of Stoicism as the Western equivalent of Buddhism. The two philosophies are actually very similar from the point of view of the ethics. Their metaphysics is different. Their, 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 their view of how the world works is different. But their ethics are actually very similar. And when I say this, people tend to be incredulous because they say, oh, but Stoicism is really tough. It's, 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 a, it's a demanding philosophy. And my response there is, well, every philosophy or religion is tough. It's not easy to be a good Christian. Now, it's easy to say you're a Christian. Um, but sure, everybody can do that. Or it's easy to say you're a Buddhist. But being a good Buddhist, you know, pra actually practicing the, the, the Eightfold Path, uh, it's, it's not easy. Actually practicing what the Gospels say you should do, you know, be, be, live your life in, in that way, that's not easy. So I don't think it's any different from, from Stoicism. And we already talked about the fact that some people do practice Stoicism in a way that, you know, Marcus Aurelius would probably not recognize as Stoicism. So um, I think there is 
every reason to think that the philosophy is here to stay. Its popularity in the moment may go up or down, that doesn't really matter. Uh, the, the thing is, if it is useful to people, and, and it looks like it is, I have a lot of testimonies uh, from people that read my books or my, or my articles, and they keep telling me that this has actually changed their life uh, for the better, sometimes in dramatic ways, sometimes in more sort of mundane, day-to-day uh, -day, uh, ways. It's a useful tool, it's a useful way of looking at life. It's not the only way. Uh, it may work for some people better than, than for other people. Um, we don't know, we're actually doing some research about whether there are some personality types that respond better to, to stoicism uh, as opposed to other philosophies. But yeah, my guess and also in a sense my hope is that it is here to stay because it's, it's a good thing. Asimo, thank you so much. It was a pleasure.